Jim Glickenhouse is the most interesting man in motorsport. If you know nothing about Jim, by the end of this video, you are going to be pretty much, I think, in awe at this man who has decided to go head to head with some of the biggest automotive giants in the world, Ferrari, Porsche, Peugeot, Toyota. He is battling them in the World Endurance Championship in the highest hypercar class. This is the most expensive, the most complicated, the most prestigious class in endurance racing. This is where they go to Le Mans for the 24 hours. Now I'm here at Spa. I was invited by Glickenhaus and one of their sponsors, GT Manager, which is a mobile racing game you play on your phone and got to spend a lot of time with Jim to understand what really makes him tick. And he is an extraordinary character. I hope you're really going to enjoy this interview. We talk about a lot of stuff, what it's like to go up against these massive companies. We talk about that tweet about sim racing or maybe not about sim racing. We'll get onto it and really understanding what motivates Jim because he is an incredibly suave, considered operator that is so knowledgeable about all levels of motorsport. Now, if any time in this video you do really enjoy it, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Make sure you like the video as well. That enables me to do more stuff like that. We're going to get into the video now. And wow, what a privilege to spend time with this man. Let's go. Right, so this is an amazing interview. We're here with Jim Glickenhouse, who I think is possibly the most interesting man in motorsport. Well, I don't know about that, but thank you. <laughs> but we've just, uh, to give an example, we've just seen the um, pit walk here at Spa Six Hours WEC. I don't think there's that many hypercar team owners that would be out the front signing as many autographs as you. What is it about Spa and WEC that makes you want to be there in front of all the fans and, and right at the forefront? Well, I think the fans are just so important because that's who we're racing for. And, um, you know, we can bring publicity for our sponsors who help us race by doing that. And we can encourage people to think well of our brand and um, perhaps purchasing one of our cars or some of our team gear and helping us. But it's important just to be out and about. I mean, I remember when I would go to races as a kid, I was always so grateful for people who would let me see things or talk to me and things like that. So I think it's important to do. I think, I think it's incredible from a fan perspective to get that kind of access. I know in Formula One or other series, you just would not have it. But if we talk about the car for a second, because we were at Part Firma yesterday and we had a little bit of a chat about the Clickhouse car. I think it is the most beautiful car on the grid here. It's achingly beautiful. And from your perspective as the owner, is that important to you? Do you care if it's just fast and that's it? Or do you also want it to be beautiful? Oh no, it's very important that it's beautiful. I mean, I'm lucky enough to have a collection of um, some original Le Mans cars, the Ford Mark IV that Mark Donahue drove with Bruce McLaren to fourth overall in 1967, the Ferrari P34 that Chris Amon and Lorenzo Bandini won the 24 Hours of Daytona in, and um, I have a wonderful Lola T70 that raced in the period, and to me, that was the era of really beautiful cars. And, uh, Um, but that was the era of beautiful cars and it was very important to me that um, our car is pretty and um, it's fast enough and we're yeah. doing the best we can to to make it as fast as we can it's extremely difficult against the giants like Toyota and Ferrari um, who were uh, Cadillac Porsche Peugeot who were all racing against but we're doing the best we can yeah it's interesting you talk about owning those classic 60s endurance cars because the front of the Glickenhaus and we'll have some b-roll now it's such a sort of low slung front that it sort of to me evokes those sort of cars like the original gt40 and the ferraris of that, of that era rather than the other cars are a bit blocky at the front and i wonder if that's because it sounds like you're very serious about selling customer cars and therefore if the car's good looking you're more likely to sell them but maybe for the other manufacturers 
that's the fish I don't know. Can you tell us a little bit more about the customer side of things and, and selling these cars to customers and the, and the challenges? Well, I think that everything that we do with racing is geared to make customers interested in our road legal cars. And our road legal cars have the same beautiful lines as our race car. And they're authentic in the sense of our GT3, which we race at the Nuremberg uh, is very close to our 004 uh, S and CS road cars. And our four-door boot is really very close to the vehicle we race in the Baja. And I think it's important in the older days, you could get into your car, drive to the track, tape the headlights, race, and go home. And we're trying to bring that era back uh, to fans. Is that part, because I, we have to say, Getting a podium at Le Mans last year, the first American manufacturer to get a podium at Le Mans in however many years. A lot of that, I think, down to reliability, not running a hybrid car. Is that, again, a, a, a deliberate choice to sort of evoke that simplicity and the reliability and that pureness? You can probably hear you on that mic, I think. Uh, um, the thing for us is sometimes less is more. And more simple cars are reliable. And in a 24-hour race, you have to finish. And uh, that is our goal, is to have a good pace, but uh, to not have reliability issues. And, and you saw that over the lead up to this race. I mean, Porsche has had some problems. Uh, people have had some problems and uh, we've run without any issues at all so that's always a good thing yeah it must be a massive coup every time like you're here at spa ahead of both the peugeots ahead of a toyota that didn't even make qualifying ahead of a porsche yeah and a porsche as well and these teams just have massive budgets so i think a lot of people watching if you don't know a lot about wec but you want to support a team I think Glickenhaus might be the perfect team for you because it does stand out amongst these absolute automotive giants. Um, I'm here this weekend with GT Manager, that's a sponsor of your car. It's a, it's a mobile management um, racing game you can play on your phone. And I've got an interesting question for you, maybe, as an owner, someone that um, uh, chooses or is involved in the choosing of drivers. So every driver in this game has a ranking across four characteristics. So you have velocity like speed, overtaking, defending, and tire management. When you're looking at drivers, and you have an incredible driver lineup here today, and also you have at Le Mans, which out of those four, if you had to only choose one, would you say that's the thing that I really want to do best at? You know, I think it's very hard just to choose one. They're all very important. The thing that we look for in drivers is experience, frankly, maturity, and not just going out um, super fast every second because um, that can result in uh, offs and accidents and things. And you know, the race is not always to the swift, it's to the people who persevere. And I think that um, in the training that people do uh, on platforms such as uh, GT uh, is, the, you know, they learn to manage all those things. As you said, the tires, the speed, the VMAX, the overtaking. But on GT Manager, it doesn't do you any good if in the process of overtaking you crash out. So that's what we try to uh, have drivers learn to do. I think that's, I mean, it doesn't get more authentic than that, but if you want to be a great racing driver, I think it's not just about doing one thing. I know a lot of people be proud of their overtaking skills, but if you want to do endurance racing, a six hour race, a three hour race, or a 12 or a 24 hour race, you need to have all those assets. 
Now, I need to ask you, a lot of people will want me to ask a question about a tweet that came out, I think, last year. The what? The tweet that came out last year about real cars on, on real tracks. Yeah, you know, you know, the most bizarre thing about the internet is people don't read what you wrote. That had nothing to do with sim racing. It was directed at Aston Martin, who was uh, originally going to enter, uh, did not enter, caused a huge screw up in the rules because of the horsepower changed because of them. Uh, we lost our ability to work with Alfa Romeo uh, because their engine could not make enough horsepower. And you know they had they were talking about how great their cars, you know their track day versions were on the track. And my answer to them was. Um, it, you know, track day only cars don't impress me. Come race in the real race. And someone bizarrely thought that was directed at sim racers and had nothing to do with sim racers. But, you know, the, the truth on the internet, uh, frankly, is very elusive. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I didn't really get that involved in that and I was surprised that it took that direction but you know y you need to reach out to people who are smart enough to listen to what you're saying and think about what you're saying and that comment had nothing to do with sim racing it was directed at Aston Martin well there you go that's the no kind of uh, out of context that's it there was a lot of things going with the regulations and a lot of i think politics and yeah I mean, that, that's all that was it was like they were bragging on what an incredible car the valkyrie was on the track and i was saying hey drive your car from new york to ensenada race the baja 1000 in la paz and drive it home that's real you know go to the nuremberg ring with a version of your gt3 that is very close to your road car. It's not. And uh, all of these ultra hyper car have nothing to do with racing. I mean, if a Valkyrie came and tried to race uh, the 24 hours of the mall, it would be a disaster. So what do you think Aston Martin's goal or these companies, Toyota, what do you think their objective is when they enter hyper cars or make noises about entering it? Is it really just a, a kind of play to sell more of their, their vehicles down the line as a halo effect because Glickenhaus seems more of a, of a pure racing team. So what do you think their objectives are when they... When they you them? know, I think that everybody has a lot of objectives and um, some of them work, some of them don't. And I don't really look to what other people think or what they do. I mean, I think if you have a company like Ferrari and Porsche, they make wonderful sports cars and I think that they have a long racing tradition and I think that that is a, a good thing for their brand, um, other brands that will come in. And then I think you have companies like Peugeot, for example, who are demonstrating their technological prowess. I mean, it's very brave to try to make a car like they did with no massive rear wing. Can they make it work? I have great respect for that. And Peugeot has raced at Le Mans for many years very successfully. And they always were kind of, kind of counterintuitive. I mean, I remember when they had that car that went 250 miles an hour on the Mulsanne. It was sort of saying, hey, let's make an ultra low drag car. And uh, it, it's very interesting. And I think, um, you know, if you look at a company like Toyota, who spends incredible amounts of money on research and development and uses what they learn to make um, really well-functioning road cars. I, I think that's why, you know, they're in racing. And I think Cadillac is using it to um, advance all their technology and um, the other, you know, players in it. But um, I do think it's important to be honest about it. And, um, you know, I have great respect for Mercedes races successfully in GT3 and in Formula One, but um, they are not in any way implying that their Project One is a hypercar that can race in the West. And um, that's wonderful and fine, but, you know, I think that what Aston did was really unconscious.
We'll do a separate video on that because there's a lot of very interesting and positioning going on by these automotive brands. I don't want to keep you any longer, Jim, because I know you're about to head out. Just one final question. Starting from P8 today in, at Spa Six Hours, what do you think is possible? What, what are you hoping for in terms of results? Oh, you know, I, I think that racing is so complex and there's so many things. How do the other guys hold up? What happens with the weather? Uh, do you make a mistake in the pits? Do the drivers make a mistake? So, you know, anything could happen, but our goal is to run well, not make mistakes, and be running at the end of the race, and I think if we are, uh, we'll do fine. Okay, well, we'll put the result at the end of this video, but Jim, it's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah. Said, I said at the beginning, the most interesting man in motorsport. I think that's been the most interesting interview I've done for a very, very, very long time. So thank you so much for making the time. Our viewers are really, really, really going to enjoy it. Thank you so much. Well, that was awesome. <laughs> that's just like speak. You have so much knowledge about motor just every level of motorsport. It's crazy. Wow, what an amazing interview. And by the way, if you enjoyed this interview, please make sure you share this video. Make sure you like, subscribe. Because of your support like that, I get to go through these sort of things and kind of share these experiences with you. By the way, Glickenhaus finished P7 in the Spa 6 Hours, actually ahead of both Peugeots. One of the Peugeots got a post-race pit stop infringement penalty, which is exactly the sort of stuff Jim was talking about in terms of not making mistakes. And it was really interesting to spend the day with Glickenhaus and just see how such a lean team operates. There's sort of no room for error, no margin for error. You can even see here walking back to the garage, it's all very sort of... Um, it reminds me actually of karting almost that sort of level compared to Porsche and Toyota bringing their massive motorhomes. But let me know if you want to see more WEC on the channel. And if so, I'll see you in the next video.